Charles Darwin once took a ride on one of these. And it was something about their shells that gave him the first hint that living creatures change over time. The giant tortoises of the Galapagos Islands are among the many unique animals here. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That got Darwin to thinking about how new species come into being. Today, the island's creatures still amaze their visitors and provide insights into how evolution works. <laughs> I have good beginner's luck. I'm Alan Alda. Join me and the creatures that inspired Darwin as we voyage to the Galapagos. In 1831, at the age of 22, Charles Darwin set off on a voyage that would change not only his life, but ours as well. The naturalist on a British naval ship, the Beagle, Darwin traveled around South America and beyond. What he saw on an isolated group of islands out here in the Pacific began an intellectual voyage that would last some 20 years and would culminate in the then shocking idea that living things are not designed according to an unchangeable plan, but instead are shaped by the world around them. These mockingbirds, like the saddleback tortoise, are from the island of Española. These mockingbirds are having a flick fight. They flick their wings and their tail back and forth. It's a territorial display between two big groups of mockingbirds that are families, and they're disputing what's going on at the territorial boundary. So they, they do this big display saying, you know, if you cross this boundary, this is what's gonna happen to you. It's gonna be bad. Dave Anderson is one of the few biologists with permission to come to the Galapagos year after year to pursue his research. The rules governing his visits are strict, and everything he brings in must go out. Mockingbirds are a constant presence in this camp on Española, and they seem eager to volunteer for a show and tell. On this island, the mockingbird species is larger than on other islands, and on this island, the beak is uh, long and curved. They use that to move dirt around. They dig more on this island than on other islands. And also the breast feathers are whitish and speckled. And some of the other species are much cleaner in the breast. The point is that nearby islands have very different looking birds. It's no problem for even an amateur birder to know the difference between species of mockingbirds. In addition to the Española mockingbirds, two other islands have their own distinct species. Then there's a fourth species common across most of the islands, including here on the northeasternmost island, Henaveza. They all look a little different depending on the island yeah. they come from. Yeah. So, for example, those Española birds had a lot of speckling on their breast, and this one really doesn't. This one's got a clean white breast. It looks cleaner all the way around. Those Española birds look sort of ratty and dirty. Are you going to let them go? Um, yeah. Okay. We can try hypnotizing them. Oh. Can he fly if he's hypnotized? He'll go to sleep. Mockingbirds joined the giant tortoises on Darwin's list of creatures that, for some mysterious reason, were slightly different on different islands. All right, I will now make this mockingbird wake up. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't even give him a post-hypnotic <laughs> suggestion. That was amazing. Dale, dale. During his five weeks in the Galapagos, Darwin visited only four of the islands. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that great? Howdy, bud. Yet he managed to collect hundreds of specimens of birds, animals, and plants. This was one of the islands, Darwin. Yeah, this is uh, Floriana. This is the second stop, actually, in the Galapagos. By now, Darwin was becoming increasingly excited by the natural history of the islands. Everywhere, he was seeing what he called aboriginal creations, animals and plants found nowhere else what biologists now call endemic species. In one place. Yeah. On Floriana alone, he identified 21 endemic plants. So what, what plants here are, are, are endemic to this island? Well, here we've got uh, Lecocarpus, this little uh, yellow daisy, and this one here with the hairy leaves, this is Galacia villosa. And once again, Darwin noticed that different islands had their own unique versions, including a species of Scalacia that grows into a 30-foot tree. But there was something else besides the uniqueness of the plants and animals here. They seemed to Darwin to bear a striking resemblance to those he'd just seen in South America. And a 
tremendous idea began to germinate. Perhaps here in the Galapagos, he was close to nothing less than the origin of species. The natural history of these islands is eminently curious and well deserves attention. Most of the organic productions are aboriginal creations found nowhere else. There's even a difference between the inhabitants of the different islands. The archipelago is a little world within itself, or rather a satellite attached to America, whence it has derived a few stray colonists. Hence, both in space and time, we seem to be brought somewhere near to that great fact, that mystery of mysteries, the first appearance of new beings on this earth. It would be two more years the Beagle's voyage finally over before the mystery of mysteries began to resolve itself in his mind. It happened as he was puzzling over another group of creatures that, while he was here, he hadn't paid much attention to. The little birds now called Darwin's finches. We're setting up a mist net to catch one of the group of birds that has become literally synonymous with Darwin and his theory of evolution. This just needs to be loose like this? Yeah, what happens is the bird flies in and doesn't see it, and so it carries the net out with it with its momentum and then sags down, hanging like this in a little bag. Can they hear that? It's not to go like this. It, 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 do you do that when you've been here too long? Uh, birders act like they know what they're doing, and they make these little squeaky sounds, and they all pretend like it makes a difference. <laughs> I don't know if it does or not. Well, you got one. You got one. It's a sharp beak ground finch. We'll get it by Our its... bizarre calls have netted us a bird from one of the 13 different species of finches in the Galapagos, birds that are today known collectively as Darwin's finches. Now, what is this again? This is the sharp beak ground finch. This is the smallest ground finch on this island. It's got a pointy little beak that's great for grass seeds. Today, Darwin's finches are in all the textbooks as the classic example of how living things adapt to their environment. Each of the 13 species in the Galapagos has a different beak that suits its lifestyle, from feeding off cactus flowers to using twigs to dig out insects from the bark of trees. A group of species known as ground finches are the most common. This is the large ground finch, with a thick, heavy beak perfect for cracking open large, tough seeds. The sharp-beaked ground finch, by contrast, eats mainly small seeds. If you gave this guy a gram of small seeds to eat, it would get done a lot faster than with this guy. He's just got too much beak in the way. He's got too much equipment there, yeah. yeah. It's, it's too big, it's too bulky. Yeah. yeah, he can handle it, but not fast enough. Yeah. So he'd have to spend more energy on feeding himself, and he needs the energy <laughs> to do it. <laughs> yeah, his, his net intake would probably be negative. Wow, so he, so he could, although he's probably eating all day long, he could eventually starve to death. Yeah, yeah, he, he's got expenses. He's got yeah. overhead, he's yes, got to pay. Right. too much overhead. And, yeah. you know, you look at the body sizes, and he's got a lot more overhead yeah. than this one. Yeah. Contrary to legend, Darwin himself didn't pay much attention to the dull little birds that often hopped around his feet. He collected several dozen while he was here, but he didn't even bother to label them or note which island they came from. But by a delicious twist of fate, it's the finches on one of the Galapagos Islands, an island Darwin didn't even visit, that have become the single best proof that his theory of evolution is no longer only a theory, but an observable fact. Yep. Yep. As we approach the island, I can see why Darwin never landed here. You mean on the face of that cliff? Right there. Yep. It's, it looks a little worse from here than it really is. It or maybe not. It's not only a cliff, the cliff sticks out at the top. The island, called Daphne Major, is only a mile or so across. For some quarter century now, a team of biologists and a string of graduate students, including briefly Dave Anderson, have been coming here every year. Kind of like a spider. 
The researcher's single purpose has been to weigh and measure every one of the few hundred ground finches that share this lump of volcanic rock with low, rather scrubby vegetation, some seabirds, and not much else, apart from the occasional grumpy sea lion. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Just passing through. Why do people go to all this trouble of getting on this thing? What, uh, what, what's the significance to science of Daphne Major? Well, there's some folks who call Daphne Major the laboratory of evolution. Um, it's a really great place to see evolution actually happening because the system, uh, the biological system, is relatively simple. Not too many components, and uh, it, for the finches it kind of boils down to what seeds are here and what tool do I have to crack those seeds. The main ground finch here is about halfway in size between the two species Dave and I looked at earlier. What the researchers have found is that when small seeds are plentiful, usually in rainy years, the beaks of the birds born the following year are also, on average, smaller. When there are plenty of large seeds in drier years, the next generation has beaks that are larger. This is evolution, and its driving force, Darwin's great insight, is natural selection. Here's what's happening. In every generation of finches, there's a range of beak sizes, some a little smaller than the average, some a little larger. When small seeds are plentiful, when there's been plenty of rain, the smaller beaked birds are the more efficient eaters, so they thrive and produce more offspring than the larger beaked birds. The result is that in the next generation, there are more small than large beaked birds. The average beak size is smaller than the last generation the population has evolved. When conditions change and a dry year brings more large seeds than small, then large-beaked birds do better. They leave more offspring, and the population shifts toward a larger average beak size. Smaller to larger, larger to smaller. It's these subtle shifts in beak size that the researchers have so meticulously documented. The really significant thing they found is that oscillating back and forth, that the size of the beak really does change over short periods of time and they know exactly why it's because their food supply changes and that's that's a case of actually seeing evolution in in, in progress to see it as it happens yeah yeah the really cool thing about this for, for everybody scientists and everybody else is that it, there's no question that it is evolution happening in front of our eyes we don't have to think of evolution as being something that you only get from the fossil record or theorizing about you can go to a place like Daphne Major where it's simple and you can actually see the evolution happening on a almost a monthly basis but certainly an annual basis I've often heard people say people sympathetic to the idea of evolution that you have to uh, take a little bit of it on faith but uh, you don't have to take any of it on faith. Not anymore. <laughs> not anymore. Not after this study. People visit here. I'm not just scientists. They need a trail that's established. It's wonderfully appropriate that evolution should move from theory to fact in the study of Darwin's finches. Because it was while Darwin himself was trying to make sense of his haphazard finch collection that the idea of evolution first occurred to him. With it, he could explain not only why different islands have different finches, but also different mockingbirds, different plants, different tortoises. From the time their ancestors arrived in the archipelago, the animals on different islands have gone their own independent ways, shaped by the conditions they found themselves in, until eventually they became different species.